Hi, Reverend Bell. It's so good to see you. Thank you for coming on. Well, time to morning to you. I, you know, I was just thinking, because uh, we just talked this weekend, I mean, literally just days ago, but I I happened upon, you know, I always happen upon something on the internet. Uh, and I, I, for some reason, I read a medical journal where they did a study, you know, with the brain waves and, and lighting up the brain. They did this study. So when you get a hug, a certain part of your brain lights up. Right, mm -hmm. they discovered that the mere act of of holding your own heart, touching your heart for a few minutes, mm -hmm. lights up that same exact place in your brain that a hug does. Wow! So I read that and I go, "What great therapy for people!" You know, it's, people all need a hug, hug, right? But they're alone, right? And but it's a self hug, which goes right along with my self love. And I read that and I go, I, I got to share that. So you're it, right? So I'm sharing this with you today. So it's like, hey, this is something new, but it's probably been around. It's like last year when I discovered, after always telling everybody, well, I think with my heart, I talk with my heart, I feel with my heart, everything's with my heart, right? That's my logic. And then they fi find out there's a study done just a decade ago or less, where they discovered that the tissues that make up the brain, there's like almost 20% of the heart actually made of like brain tissue. So you actually do think with your heart, feel with your heart, love with your heart. It's actually a part of your consciousness. So the heart's more involved in this physically than one realizes. So I'm kind of throwing that out to people because we always said that all of us new age people, quote unquote, you know, I, you know, there's a, a heart chakras, I, you know, we got our heart into this, I, you know, send you for my heart. Everything's always about the heart. It's true. And if you focus on the heart and your intentions to give love or healing from the heart, it's real. And uh, it, it really does. Little tidbits I picked up while waiting to interview with you. Uh, yesterday and today, I discovered these things. So there you go. So we got something new to add to this thing. I love that. I mean, the brain tissue around the heart is fascinating. I can actually feel it when you said it, the brain and the heart coherence, it felt like. Yeah. And so we, we really got to be careful with the heart, mm -hmm. with our thoughts. And because there's a negative side of this too. Like, I wonder why I've had, I've had about 13 or 14 major heart attacks. I probably had 30 heart attacks, but I mean, my major, I'm talking about quadruple bypass surgery, eight stents, you know, going, I mean, major stuff, you know, clear, you know. So when I say major, I mean major. And, and I kind of wonder, I go, geez, I've been a vegetarian pretty much 60 years, 70 years, you know, uh, meditate, uh, don't smoke, don't, all the things, you know, don't smoke, don't drink, all these things, right? I'm doing all the positive stuff. And then I talked to this Indian doctor. In fact, somebody down there in San Diego, you probably know. But, but I, I just threw it out to this person. And I said, because the person's a heart specialist. And I said, uh, is it possible that every time I used to counsel PTSD veterans or people going through real traumatic stuff, I'd come back for like, 40, 50 years, I tell my wife when I got through somebody, I go, man, that just kills my heart. That breaks my heart. That kills my heart. That tears my heart up. I used words and language like that probably 20,000 times every every decade, at least. Probably 100,000 times in my life I've used that, you know, in affirming that that's what's actually happening. So I told the doctor, and she was an Indian doctor, you know, and she both Western and, and Indian music uh, uh, medicine and i was thinking you know the brain really can't tell the difference between you know the uh uh, uh what sort of mm -hmm. looking for 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 me using it as a metaphor versus in reality so my i asked her I said, is it possible that my heart is reacting to all this negative stuff coming to it you know all these sad stories and stuff from people and so it naturally builds 
blockages yeah. to keep it away from the heart. And she looked at me and she goes, yeah, it's possible. That's the first time anybody's ever affirmed that. I don't know if she's the only one that believes that, but it was like, it affirmed what I thought was happening to me because all the other stuff I was doing correct. But every day I was affirming that my heart was breaking, that my heart was hurting, that was in pain. It was, I was affirming that just like saying, I am whatever you are. I was affirming this all the time and giving that power, the opposite of healing power, I was destroying my heart. So the heart was trying to, to love it and protect me by keeping everything blocked away from it. So anyway, that's that was a, something I learned a couple of years ago, and, I'm, and I stopped doing that. Uh, I'm very careful about what I affirm. It's like even if I'm having having a middle of a heart attack or something, or I'm having a major medical issue. Don't if I actually ask me as a doctor how I feel. I'm feeling great. The body's having problems, but I feel great. I, not me, it's just the body. But whatever you say after I am, it's really important. So I am healthy. I am. I am loved. I am. I am love. I'm. I'm whatever I am. That's why. I. I, I think there's a limit to what uh, all these uh, twelve-step groups can do. They can take people so far, but every time they have a meeting, some of these people go to three, four, or five meetings a week, and they get up and they always affirm their problem: "I'm an alcoholic. I'm a drug addict. I'm a gambler. You know, alcoholic. I'm sex addict. I'm whatever it is." Every time they say that, they're reaffirming the negative about themselves. So I know the program has saved millions of lives worldwide. So, I mean, who am I to second guess them? But I'm thinking there's a 13th step that has to come. You know, they got 12 steps. They need a 13th step that now affirms the positive mm -hmm. and recognizes that they are something. That's like Christianity. Mm -hmm. I'm a sinner. I was born in sin. It's all sin. I'm sinning. I'm never going to be pure. And, I, and it's not not the way I go. It's like, no, we're all made in the image of God because God and I are one. You and I are one. We're all God. So who's a sinner? God's not a sinner. The dream that we're dreaming maybe is quote unquote sinful. Uh, it's not, you know, positive energy. But reaffirming who and what you are really creates your, your your destiny. And so uh, I'm out there. You've been to my healing workshops. And I'm, without any dogma, without any uh, uh, religious propaganda or rituals or beliefs, I don't go there. I just kind of keep it. Love yourself. Forgive yourself. Be grateful. Mm -hmm. And I found that no matter what religion you follow, or what you even believe, it doesn't matter. Incorporate these three attributes, these three habits, these three mantras, whatever you want to call them, into your life, and you're going to find health at the physical, mental, and spiritual level. We're both dealing with healing people at different, different things. We both realize at this stage, I mean, listen to a couple of your interviews, and read your stuff, uh, you realize as well that all illness is virtually based. I don't, I, you know, it could be a broken foot. It can be mental illness. It can be whatever it is. All illness is spiritually based. So if you just work on the illness, mentally or physically, just work on that. You never dig up the roots. You keep wondering why the weeds keep coming back, you know. You cure somebody and you come back a year later, they got the same problems again because you never pulled up the roots. And the roots is all about your spiritual, your spiritual health, your spiritual beliefs, your spiritual thoughts. So I try to take the people to this place where words. It starts with self-love because in the purest sense, self-love is God love. Since the God me bows to the God in you, meaning God's us, right? 
So when I love me, people say, well, how do I know? How do I know if I'm loving me? How do I love me? And I say, how do you love God? It's the same thing. When you recognize God in you, then you'll recognize God in your enemy, your neighbor, your spouse, your whoever. So that's kind of what I've been doing. And thank you for attending this weekend, going to one of mine. Or, so I, I hope I, I didn't bore you, but it was like, um, it was so I, 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 funny. Yeah, I, I do these little two hour things because that's about all people can handle in a short period of time. But I really, I'm looking at next year doing retreats where it's all day Friday, Saturday, and, you know, mm -hmm. half a day Sunday, where people can really get down into it, eat together, live together, meditate together, not just listen to a lecture, but participate by meditating and by, you know, fellowship. Because I'm finding that without a spiritual fellowship, without not that community of support, one's going to drown in an ocean of, of aloneness. You know, you, you're you not alone. And when you start seeking the divine in yourself and others, you find a community and you recognize it. The signature vibration and frequency is there. You're naturally attracted to it. It draws you in like a magnet. And uh, that's when changes happen. But it's, it's important, as I'm finding out, I mean, even for I, I, I find that if I got fellow travelers with me, the journey's a lot easier. Meditating with other people is always easier. Having friends is the greatest gift in the world. You don't have to have 10,000 Facebook friends. If you got one, two true friends, meaning somebody that you could bleed your heart out to and you don't have to worry about being betrayed because there's a lot of that out there. People are so wanting to trust somebody that they just spill their guts to somebody and then it turns into ammunition against you and, you know, social groups. And, you know, I've seen that. So anyway, that's what I'm doing. Thanks for inviting me on here. So, so, so I feel so grateful and honored that you're here sharing this the workshop was amazing you did the blessing on all of our heads which you know i felt like it was working through for like four days after and so i love your workshops they always bring big shifts <clears throat> excuse me i think i'm clearing something. What's, what's interesting about that is I, i've toned down the energy i mean a lot so yeah, I, I think I talked about it a little bit because I was people were getting actually knocked out in chairs and you know they were just they were seeing flashing lights and you know uh, this one lady in Eastern Europe she saw a tornado of light and love and energy just coming down on her. Uh, I mean a lot of stuff gets so. I, what I don't want to do is turn it into Reverend Bill. He's out there giving energy and he's healing. No. What I want is Reverend Bill is awakening in you and jumpstarting your energy. Right? I put it all back on the person. I want you to find your energy. I want you to use that. I want you to heal yourself. I want you to find that own that own teacher that's inside of you, that your own guru that's inside of you. I want you to be the healer. I want you to truly be in charge of your own life. And Reverend Bill's not looking to take on any responsibility for anybody else. So it's like, I'll take you to the water. I'll give you a cup. You got to drink it. And uh, if you spill the, the water, that's up to you. But it's like, here it is. So I, I'm finding, though, that it's a hungry, thirsty world. Uh, I don't care if it's Germany. I don't care if it's India. I don't care if it's the Czech Republic, Switzerland, England, wherever I go, Iceland, doesn't matter. Wherever I go, even though the language and the culture is different, it's always the same soul problem. Mm. You know, it's just, even if it's interpreted into another language, it doesn't matter. It's always that, I, I can feel to see the energy, it's the same. Mm. And self-love is 
the world disease because there's a lack of it. You know, it's it's like, oh, you got you know, you, you get a lack of vitamin D, you know, a lack of vitamin E, whatever the doctor makes a prescription for you. I'm going out there and I'm saying there's a lack of vitamin L. Mm -hmm. Love. Yes. So take a little love in the morning, take a little love during the day, make sure you got love at night. But without love, you have no health, spiritually, mentally, or physically. And it gets to be a very lonely, lonely world. And when people find themselves alone, even in today's culture where everybody's got a cell phone, everybody's got online, you got Zoom, you got Facebook, you got Instagram, you got more communication now than you have at any time in history. And yet people are lonely more than they were in the Middle Ages. You know, we got television, we got, uh, you know, videos, we got more communication form than we've ever had and less actual communication. A lot of LOLs, you know, and, you know, all this other stuff, but real communication, love. And that's not just words because words are cheap. There's power behind the words and the intentions behind the words. And it's interesting, but a child knows when they're being loved. You don't have to teach a child this is what love feels like. But they know when they're getting nothing. No matter what's said, they know when they're not loved. And they also know when they're loved. And it's not about getting toys and gifts. In fact, those are some of the loneliest people just bought off. Go play with this computer. Go play with your phone. It's it's, it's that hands-on, emotional on, spiritual hug that you get from those closest to you. And you deal with the damage. You've got people coming to you that didn't get that in childhood or previous lifetimes. I'm a, a firm believer that there are no victims, which kind of throws off all psychologists because they're always dealing with, you know, this happy in childhood and all that. I'm saying, no, that was set up coming into here. That's exactly what they've earned to get exactly what they needed. And it's not always, it's not a punishment. It's just the bills come due or you need to learn this to teach your parents or to teach yourself or for you to teach others. But sometimes somebody not getting it themselves some of the most beautiful people I know really know how to love when they become an adult. They know how to feel and have empathy for others. How they learn that? By not getting any of it when they were young. And now they give it. You know, but you can't really give it until you give it to yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, the cup, the cup is empty. You, you can't pour anything from it. So uh, blessings to you and others that are out there working with individuals. I don't do that. I kind of work at this other level with groups. Uh, and there's some people that come to me. Uh, and I, I, I read what they sent me or listen to it. And I'm going, no, you need professional help. And I don't mean that as an insult to them. You know, it's like, no, no, this is not spiritual stuff you're looking for. This is basic. You know, you really need, you need to come to grips with life and things and stuff. So, I've come to the point in time, not only have I reached a point where I listen to people, but I'm also not afraid to tell people now, though, no, I'll take care of your spiritual problems and questions, but you got to deal with these emotional things because that's holding you up on these other areas. You really need, and there really is a place for spiritual counselors out there that, that can attack problems from a spiritual perspective and through psychology, and through therapeutic methods. It's all needed. It's all tools of God. Uh, I, I just, mm -hmm. uh, it's not me. I mean, I got, I got over a thousand emails a day. I mean, I can't handle it, right? It's just, and uh, so I, now that you're on my list, I may send people to you. I'm always looking for people. I'm saying, no, here, look, contact Dr. So-and-so. See this person, you know. Anyway, 
So I do agree with you though that like even like with people come to me, I know the trauma they went through is a part of their purpose now. You know, if I'm working with them, healing it, but at the same time, I'm like, well, why did they go through this? What are they meant to do for the world with it? I always am kind of trying to flip it into a positive and saying you're not a victim if it happened to you. Either you did it in a past life. Or in this lifetime, you chose to do it to learn from it. There's like karma is like very mathematic, you know. Could you please share about karma? Or yeah. 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 But people have this tendency, especially Western culture. Oh, you're sick. What did you do bad last lifetime? Oh, your kid's born and, and, and has mental deficiencies. What did you, well, he must have been a bad. It's got nothing to do with being good or bad last time because there's so many factors into karma and because some people will choose a hard life. There are people just want to burn up as much karma as they can. Give me, give me a bad body. Give me a bad mind. Give me insanity. It doesn't matter. Uh, or they have a debt to the parent. They want to teach the person that's their parents. They want to teach them compassion and how to love and care and give. And by them coming in like that, it teaches them a big gift. You know, it's a big gift for them. Uh, if they're open to the gift. See, a lot of people, my God, why did this happen to me? I'm a victim. Uh, I got this child that's, you know, defective and blah, blah, blah. Instead of this child was a gift. What am I supposed to get from this gift? What gift do I give the child? What gift is the child giving me? And when you approach everything, not as a lesson, which means it sounds like a punishment. You got to learn this. No, you got to find the gift. That's all. Just find the gift. It, it may not be easy. Uh, I mean, I watch people's lives and they come to me when they're my age or 10, 15 years younger. And they, they got all these problems. They've been through four divorces and they, they've been through this and that. They've had alcoholic spouses. And, and I'm going, you know, if you would have came to me when you're 18, maybe I could have helped you. Uh, it's There's nothing I could do for you now. And you've created all this karma. And it's interesting that every every spouse that you got rid of you married somebody had the same exact problems again. It's, it's mm -hmm. repetitive. So there's something that's mutually happening in every relationship. There's one person there that's always the same. Them, right? And like a magnet, they're attracting these people because that's their frequency, that's their vibration. Look at me, it hurt me. I'm, you know, I, I you know, mm -hmm. people that take a beat. Abuse, and they do take abuse, and it's really sad because I see a lot of people. And you could tell them, why don't you leave? Well, you know, he's so nice to me afterwards, you know, and I really love him. And, you know, it's like they have to reach that point where it's like either they're dead or they reach the point where they go, you know, I've woken up. I don't, I don't need to be this. So by me teaching them to love themselves first. Part of loving yourself is respecting yourself. If I love me, I'm not going to let somebody abuse me mentally, emotionally, or physically. Not going to happen. That's why I say people don't really love themselves because they really love themselves. They wouldn't abuse their mind and body with alcohol and drugs. They wouldn't allow themselves to be physically or mentally, spiritually abused. And there's abuse at all those levels. We, we've seen it with cults. You know, people join a cult and they become part of the group. Um, but people are self-destructive if they think of themselves as a victim. If they're looking for somebody to complete them. Oh, he completes me. You know, nobody completes anybody. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is, no, you got to complete you. Well, my wife doesn't make me happy. That's why I got a divorce. No, it's not her. She's not your clown. Not her job to make you happy. That's you. That's your choice. If you're either happy or not happy. You don't you don't have to make her happy. She doesn't have to make you happy. That's our individual jobs. A lot of people think it's somebody else has to do it. And well, I love that person, but they didn't love me back, so I don't love them anymore. Well, you were selling your love because you were trying to get something for your love, right? Well, if they don't love me, I don't love them anymore. So it's it's really all about loving you. Forgiving yourself, because I know when you're doing counseling like you're doing, because uh, I touch on it with people coming to me. Shame and guilt are huge, huge anchors for these people. It just weighs them down. They can't get past things they've done. I mean, I've had guys go, oh, 
uh, you know, I, I got divorced and I, I, you know, I was adulterer, you know, all this stuff, or, or I was a bedwetter, or I was, I was molested, or I was, you know, a thousand different things. I go, the key was, 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 move on. Wake up today, choose to be something else, something new, something better. So forgiveness is a huge, huge thing about going forward. Yeah. Anyway. The shame and the guilt culture comes from kind of all the religions too, right? And oh, society yeah. is all about money and looks and everybody on Instagram. And it's just the shame and guilt is very prevalent. I know a lot of guys feel oh, bad. Yeah. You know, women feel bad. I hear all kinds of stories of I'm not enough, basically, somehow, you know? So Yeah, people have this thing, especially women, I'm not enough. Mm -hmm. Everybody is enough. Mm -hmm. Everybody's one. It's it's like these guys that uh, that everyone wants to be special, right? Well, I walk. I was John the Baptist, and I walked with Jesus. I'm going, yeah, okay, fine. And they got all these lifetimes where they're famous people and everything. I'm going, sure, fine. And then I, then I'll tell them. I said, since we're all one, I was that too. Well, what do you mean? I was it. You know, I, you know, I'm just taking with the specials. I said, no, everybody was John the Baptist. Everybody was Moses. Because it's all God. It's only one player. It's only one dreamer. It's all these egos. Oh, well, no, I really was. Yeah, okay, fine. Everybody wants to be special. And Everybody we're living... From the Alpha Omega, right? The one masculine, and one feminine, everything is like an energetic signature from that. So we've all been all of it. Yeah. So we we got a lot of problems with, it, with the new age right now because uh, everybody wants to be special. People just don't want to be learning to meditate. What's the next thing they want right after that? They want to be a meditation teacher. It's like I saw when I, I was a scuba diving instructor. People would take lessons with me, and they're terrible scuba divers, but they've already made a couple of dives. They got their certification, the basic, and they already they want to become an instructor. And I'm going, what? Or they jump out of an airplane. They want to be a, you know, an instructor of that. Whatever it is, they want to be a teacher. And now everybody wants to be a healer. They take a weekend class on, online on Zoom or something and now all of a sudden they're an energy healer they got three days training not even three days they got a few hours online and uh boom they said it's the certification and next thing you know they're they're master reikis they're not just reikis but you know healers they're masters and, I, and i'm always amazed at that but i'm also going to admit this there's people out there that really 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 are energy healers they really are i i've seen it i've seen it demonstrated so that's real it's just that Everybody that claims to be one, you just can't take people to word. Uh, people want them right away, like they want fast. Like I've already, I'm, I'm, I'm already a master. It's like, excuse me, Reverend Bill's been meditating fifty years, <laughs> died thirty times. A cobra, you got to tell the cobra story, Reverend Bill. And it's like, then you can kind of claim to be, a, and you don't even claim to be a teacher at that level. So that's kind of the humbleness. I think that's a part of the Hawaiian tradition, right? Like humbleness in our path. What's you, know, humility, you know, humility is an interesting thing. Because in India, which is now in the guru business, I mean, literally, you know, he's got a million followers, and, you know, and when you got all these followers in an organization that follows you around, no matter what you do, if you do something wrong, nobody's going to tell you. They'll say, well, you don't understand it. He's at this level that, you know, <laughs> He's, he's beyond drinking. He's beyond drugs. He's beyond sex, even though he's doing it, right? And it's like, well, you, you don't understand that. because Anyway, so that gets a little abused. But right now, it's turned into a business. And people got to start looking at, instead of going through someone, at some point, when you reach a level where you got to go, I don't want any middlemen. Mm -hmm. I want to go to the source. And even like when I give online classes, I had one class, I had six gurus in it. I had all their, their students and everything. It was online during the pandemic. I had all these guys. It was like 500 people or something. And, and I'm telling this guy, he wants to ask me some questions. I said, do you really want me to tell you straight up? Oh, no, no. I said, no, no. I said, if you'd asked me this 15 years ago, I'd be a little more respectful. And I would have been, you know, because you're a guru and you got your followers here. I said, but frankly, now I'm at the age I don't really care. 
But if you really want to know what I want to say, oh, yeah, we really, really want to know what you want to say. I said, you sure. Yeah. I said, okay. I said, everybody's their own guru. Everybody's their own teacher. Everybody's their own healer. Is that not true? Well, yeah, well, yeah, okay, yeah, okay. They kind of admit to that. And I said, isn't it true that if you take on a student, they have to do 100% of everything that you've told them to do. They got to do all their meditation. They got to do all their pujas. They got to do all this stuff. And then they get your blessing. And in essence, they're doing it all themselves, right? Well, yeah, well, yeah, well, okay. So why do they need you? Mm -hmm. uh, are you the spokesman for God? You, know, you got to go through them to get the next level. Mm -hmm. That's separation. Now, let's get real, because we both deal with people that are kind of like, you know, where are they at? You know, hearing voices, you know, tell them, you know, it's crazy things. So on this stairwell, this staircase, you know, going to heaven, let's just call it a staircase. As you move up the stairs, you do need teachers. You do need gurus. You need somebody that's at a level above you to help you see the, yourself in the mirror because most people can't. So in the beginning of the search or well into the intermediate stages of your search or even into the advanced stages, having a presence of a beautiful, loving, loving, humble guru is a beautiful thing. But you always have to remember that you can go straight to the source because you are the source. And when you put everybody between you and the source, you're not gonna reach the ultimate. It's, mm -hmm. it's just not made that way. God and you are one, and then all of a sudden, even putting God out there, and people do that with their prayers. They pray to God, like the God's in another place, another dimension, he's in heaven, we're here. Instead of, when you're talking to God, it's a kind of, you're having a conversation with God just by talking to yourself, just like the book title. I met that guy and I go, you know, I said, all conversations with yourself are conversations with God. He just looked at me. I like that. That's a good one. He didn't know what to say. You know, it's like, no, because God is you. It's so everybody that talks, everybody that has this inner conversation is having a conversation with God. Is that like believing that when it's happening, it's knowing that like that is actually God, you know, and it's always going to be a loving, kind voice. It's not going to tell you like something bad about people, it's, you know, that kind of stuff. Well, it's it's your higher self. Now, your ego mm -hmm. can shade that response. Uh, that's what I'm saying in the beginning or even higher up in there. Mm -hmm. In the beginning, you need somebody to say, you know, you're crazy, you know. You're, you're not special. We're all special. Therefore, nobody's special. Shut up and sit down and, and do this work. You need somebody at that level at some place in your advanced advancement towards self-realization fellowship. So when I tell people you're your own guru, you're your own healer, your own teacher, mm -hmm. sure, yes and no. Yes at the highest self. Mm -hmm. But you get somebody that's really having a breakdown and they're schizophrenic and it, they don't want to be listening to that higher self. They're hearing voices and they're not necessarily hearing their higher self. Yeah. So. And the psychedelics, people are doing a lot of psychedelics. Yeah, I kind of throw that up. I want to talk about that because of the voice. talk about psychedelics because that's a, that's a real issue where I'm, in, yeah. I'm, I'm totally 100% against everybody that's into that. Nothing. I don't want to step on, step on a lot of toes. People watch that. They're going to go, oh, who's he to judge? You know, I'm saying, okay. With no absolutes, okay? Because somebody could say, well, this guy was a really depressed veteran and he had PTSD and they gave him ayahuasca and he was really depressed and they pulled him out. Okay. But I'm looking at people who do ayahuasca every month, every week, several times a year. Are they doing it out of love for God or are they doing it out of love of the experiences? There's a difference they're chasing an experience, a psychedelic experience, and that's different than going to God and saying, I love you, God, and just giving God love. They're looking for the experience. It's a whole different track, a whole different highway. Okay? It's like a spiritual escape. My meditation is how I could go on. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead, go ahead. 
I say, in my meditations, I don't get sick and throw up like you do on these drugs and magic mushrooms. Thing. I don't go crazy. I don't have these, you know, this possibility of breaking down and going nuts and doing some violence or whatever. Yeah. But they're wanting an instantaneous experience. All right. I understand that motive, but that's not what this is about. See, everyone wants a shortcut. They want to bypass the hours and days and all the work of meditation. It's discipline. They want to go straight to the experience. And those experiences are not the same thing as a meditation-induced experience. And even when you meditate, you shouldn't be chasing the experience. You should just be there to love God. And people aren't. They're meditating for, you know, in their mind, good reasons. They want self-realization. They want enlightenment. They want peace. They want all these things. I say, that's all gifts. You're doing that, expecting something back for it. It's like selling your love. I love you, God, but here's what I want. Just love God. No strings attached. Just love God. So I'm watching online. There's more and more videos on YouTube on psychedelics. And there's newsletters coming out and podcasts on it about all the good things about it. Like all these shamans are doing It's like just because a guy living in the jungle someplace is a shaman doesn't make him an enlightened master. Makes him a drug dealer. I'm sorry. And he does rituals and bujas. Here you go. But that doesn't make him a more loving, compassionate person. Does it make him somebody truly enlightened? Or is all his stuff induced from drugs as well? So you're throwing your hands in somebody else else and trusting that this guy through drugs whether it's magic mushrooms you know lsd uh, ayahuasca marijuana whatever it is marijuana is a little bit different but still here's why another reason i'm against it besides it being a shortcut and it's artificial it's also about when you meditate you change your frequency and your vibration you're upgrading you're downloading you're moving the energy up. These drugs don't do that. It's not about changing your frequency. It's about having an experience. And you see cobra snake, and you see weird things, and you, and then oh, oh, wow, I saw God, I heard God, I felt this. Yeah, okay, in a drug-induced state. You know, maybe there's some good out of that, maybe there's not good out of that. You know, I don't want to throw all the way, you know. Yeah, I feel like, like for PTSD, like that kind of stuff with a doctor, like present, like in small doses, but not like, like you said, people are doing it every month. Like it, it, it becomes a religion. I see them go completely off the it habit. That's what's, but like once in a while, if you have PTSD, like I had to try for like the cancer, that kind of, but it's like, but then the way they're doing it right now makes me worried because I know the spiritual path is so hard. You know, I had to meditate so many years to get a little bit of finally connected to God, I feel, you know? So I- Well, here's the deal. I was- one thousand percent against it, you know, it, that no absolutes until I was in India for three or four months in uh, 2004. And I went into this, I first got there, I went into uh, uh, Delhi and early in the morning, the sunrise, and I met a group of Sikhs that were gathering together every morning and they do. 120 some yoga uh, exercises, including laughing exercises. You know, they had eight of them where you laugh, you know, belly laughs, all this stuff. And they had all these neat things and stuff. And 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 then they, they they had a set of rules they followed and did all this stuff, you know. And one of the guys wrote a book and he gave it to me and it was all in some language. I didn't know what it was. And basically he told me, well, here's a breakdown. Of, we, we feel the 12 most important things are number one, so physical health, if you're not healthy, you can't take care of your family. Number two, education, you know, and your career. And he goes on all these beautiful things, right? And he goes, now, what do you think is the most important thing? And I said, it's not on your list. Well, we got all the great. I said, the most important thing in life is love. Without love, money, health means nothing. Job means nothing. And he got mad at me. And then you know, you know, you know, they started screaming and it got terrible. And 
because they felt, you know, they didn't understand it. Three weeks later, I was up in visiting the Himalayan Mountains. We went up to the top of this mountain where there was snow because I wanted to actually take some Himalayan snow from a mountain peak and, and taste it, you know, because it was a poetic thing. You know, I wrote a poem when I was 18 that I wanted to go to the Himalayas and, and eat snow, you know, not yellow snow, snow, right, you know. And uh, so we're coming down, there's this big storm, there's lightning and thunder. And we're going by this ancient, ancient uh, temple. And it wasn't in the guidebook, it wasn't a tourist attraction, but there was a lot of pilgrims there. So we pulled in there, me and my friend, and we're walking across the, the courtyard, cobblestone, and this group of not yogis, uh, wandering sadhus, kind of like, you know, they were all kind of like Jamaica. They all had this funny hair coming out, you know, and funny beards. And, I mean, it looked like Rishis, kind of like weird stuff. And they had asses on them and red. I mean, it was just, but they've been smoking dope for like a whole week, you know, in front of this temple underneath this little thing. And it, and people going, ah, oh, those guys are all dopers. They're over there to just smoke a dope. And, and this guy with a orange jacket on with a little Nike swish on it. Uh, he was a guru, but he had a Nike jacket with, with a loincloth. Anyway, so I'm going, okay, fine. I'm I'm walking, I got my Indiana Jones hat on, I got my Levi's on, and I got a walking stick, and the guy's going, American, American Babaji, American <laughs> Babaji, basically in that form is just a, a old spiritual, you know, father, you know, it's, it's a reverend title. Because at first I was offended. I was going, oh, there's only one Babaji, but no, it's a title, Babaji, American Babaji. So he says, come, you know, come on over. And I go, no, no, no. My friend goes, oh, no, come on, man. Because you know, me and my friend, there's a point to the story in a minute. Me and my friend have been fighting for years in that event that you can't get enlightenment from, from doing all these drugs and ayahuasca and all these different things. And uh, he was, oh, yeah, this is the way to find God for the shamans and stuff. And so I was dead set against it. All right. So totally opposite sides of the coin here. So we go over there, and they're passing this pipe around. And the pipe's got to be about that big around. I mean, it's huge. And these guys are going around, and they're both coming out of their ears, nose, everything. You know, it's just like, whoa. And uh, my friend just goes, oh, yeah. You know, anyway, I'm not. And... Uh, so it goes around and around and around. Everybody's getting high. And there's one guy just practically falling into the fire. And uh, I finally said, you know, we got to go. I said, mm -hmm. let me. I said, before I go, because I'm looking for that guru on the mountaintop experience. I was there looking for some guru to give me some good advice, right? And so I look at this guy and, and I, I looked at him. I said, okay, before I go back to America in a couple of months, what great advice would you like to give me? And I'm thinking in my mind. Here's all these dopers. They're all doped up. What, what, what kind of advice am I going to get for these people, right? So I'm ready for, okay, God, go ahead. Have a laugh here. What, what are these guys going to tell me? So before the guy could talk, the guy that's the most messed up of the whole group, practically fallen into the fire. And he's going, Gucci, Gucci, let me tell him, let me tell him. And he can barely speak English. He can barely, his eyes are rolling around. and He can hardly stand up. And then the girl goes like that, go ahead. And I'm going, okay, this is gonna be great. I tell my friend, this is gonna be, this is gonna be interesting. Go ahead. And the guy starts to talk in, in perfect English. He repeats everything I said to those guys in Delhi that morning about the most important thing in life is love. And he went down the whole exact speech. Word for word I gave, which was like seven, 800 miles away and three weeks before. Word for word, he gave me my exact talk back. And I'm going, what, what, what? It was like the universe was saying, there's nothing absolute. All right, so so I, that's my asterisk. So it's like, yeah. there's an asterisk there. It's like, you can't judge everything. But overall, overall, if you're doing ayahuasca and LSD and all these things, trying to find God, you're going down 
a path, a rocky path. And you don't know, because I just dealt with somebody overseas that was doing magic mushrooms and went, mm-hmm. you know, really bad. And this guy was, was a long time meditator and he just he got violent. Um, and that was not his nature. So you don't know what you're going to do on those things. And you don't know that that's a good thing for you. And when you recommend other people do it and, and take it, you're giving that karma to yourself, whatever the results are. So be very careful before you tell somebody, go do this. And for these people, other people to give it to somebody and say it's okay and talk about it, sell it, they're responsible for all the results. Yeah. Now, if you think they're enlightening people, great. Mm-hmm. I'm telling you, you're taking a lot of risks. You're taking on a lot of karmic baggage. Mm-hmm. And it's a lazy spiritual seeker. Mm-hmm. Do the work. The work is slow and boring and hard, but it's all about love. Otherwise, you're just on a journey for kicks. Yeah, I'm experiencing these things. This is really cool. I had this. When you have an experience when you're meditating, you know it's realer, although it could be real. It's like, even schizophrenics and people go crazy. They see demons and things. That's all real. You know, if, if you're getting off drugs and then you see stuff, that's real. It's, you know, you're seeing other dimensional things. You're doing these drugs. You're seeing things. It's real. It's interdimensional stuff. But you don't know what's going to possess you or change you and alter you in ways that you do not have control over because you've given it away. So it's big. so if I sound like I'm anti psychedelics, yes. Am I anti psychedelics to a PTSD veteran that's on going to commit suicide? And they give him this. I keep my mouth shut. That's his choice. If it works, blessings. That's like I I, I tell well, PTSD veterans and burn patients uh, coming back from the war. Hey, look, you can't handle the pain, the marijuana. Okay, whatever you got to do. Because with the pain is so great, they can't handle this. They're not going to listen to me about meditating past it. You have to take them where they're able to go. So is there an absolute no? Well, I gave you my my life experience. God was slapping me around saying it's not absolute. So I, I have to say, anytime I get all my own exact words back from people who weren't there to hear the conversation, and it's in perfect English, you got to say there was a message there for me as well. So no absolutes, but really, really, really be cautious. Even in meditating, if you're meditating for the experiences, you're missing the journey. The journey's love. It's not about self-realization. It's not about peace. It's about loving God. God. And then people spend all this time in their meditation on the technique. Oh, I'm doing a Kriya Yoga. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. Hongsa, you know, own technique, whatever techniques they got. And they spend all their time in their head. If you, if you do a lot of those, it's you're visualizing, you're feeling hot, cold, you got a mantra going, you're, you, you, things are happening, but you got to think about it and you're counting. You never got out of your mind. You never got away from thinking. When you finish the meditation technique and then you sit there and just listen to the presence of God, the silence, just give love and open your heart. More people spend more time on the technique and then they get up and they leave. They spend no time truly loving God. Well, I, was, uh, I did 144 at a Kriya Yogs, or I did, you know, 400 and something, or whatever it is. It's a number. And I watch these people, and they, they could be doing that technique for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. Are they any more compassionate? Are they any more loving? Are they any more saintly? As they're all in their head and nothing in their heart. Without bhakti, without love, 
It's a very shallow experience. You get something out of it. But you're not diving in the deep water. So if I sound like I'm anti-drugs, yes. If I sound like I'm saying no every time, I'm saying caution. You better be going with a professional. You better have a legitimate reason. And if you're that person recommending to somebody, then you're taking responsibility. So you better really be careful. There's some people that shouldn't be doing this. Sometimes, you know, there's suicide people. You've, you've handled them. There's suicide people out there. That, you know, maybe a jolt. That, you know, maybe a jolt. Uh, I would never take anybody there. But I wouldn't stop anybody. That's not my job in life to say, no, no, no. I just, I would just say, caution. Careful where you go. Just careful. Mm. Is there love there? Is it about love? Mm. That's it. How do you measure it? Is there love? Is it taking you to love? Is it taking you to the light? And some people on these things, oh, yeah, it is. Okay, great. That's their choice. That's their evaluation. Not my job to evaluate, just like I don't evaluate people's religious beliefs. Because it's all on faith. That's what they choose to believe. Um, doesn't change the real truth, whatever the truth is. You know, but if it makes them happy, if it makes them fall in love with God, yeah, let them have it. God don't care what religion you are. Don't care. God has no religion. There are no chosen people. There's nobody special. It's all God. How could there be anybody special? How could anybody be chosen? How could anybody go to hell? If everybody's God, how could God said part of himself to hell? Mm -hmm. So, I don't know. That's kind of a crazy talk. I don't know if you want to go down that way, but that's, that's what's happening out there. Yeah, that's perfect because I think, yeah, like the religions in the world are kind of like supposedly fighting. There's the, all the wars going on. You know about war firsthand. You were in the Vietnam and so you've seen a lot of things and so you understand it personally. And so, yeah, what you said about God doesn't have a religion. I've never felt God tell me follow a certain path. You know, I always felt like God told me like just building that devotion, like you said, the bhakti is the, the true connection with God. And I think you're right. Like all the religions, people are kind of trying to follow these structures instead of just like feeling God, talking to God, actually being friends with God. In the, in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, like, I'm your best friend, you know? You know, and so I really believe God is like. And here's the deal: if you follow, if you choose to follow Jesus, or Krishna, or Buddha, or Babaji, or this glowing light, call it love. Whatever way you identify with the divine within you, if it makes you love God, it doesn't make any difference. Because when you love yourself, you love God. If you're loving God, you love yourself. It's all the source. And, you and if have you're the image of God, mm -hmm. there is no I. Mm. It's only the greater us. There's just us. Us is one. It's like they got all these people out there now. Call me they. Call me them. Call me he, she. I mean, they got all these things going. I'm saying, no. Why don't we just call ourselves us? Mm -hmm. It solves the whole problem. It's just us. Yeah. No more argument. It's just us. Yes. Two letters. You don't need to do pronouns. If it's all up, yeah. It's just us. Us is us is us. We. Up and down with it. We. Big yeah. Earth, dysfunctional family. <laughs> yeah. So there you go. I like that. Us. Exactly. Because I think it's confusing the youth. You know, they're confusing them about relationships and different things. And um, the soul doesn't have any gender anyways, right? So the soul is just neutral. No, that, that's that's another whole issue that uh, here's the deal. People, everybody's, everybody's on the judgment on that and, you know, the hate and the anger. And what's interesting is even gays have an anger towards transsexuals. It's I didn't realize that was the case. Mm -hmm. But there's a division even there. So they're really the outcasts. And I'm trying to tell people there is no soul gender. It's us, it's we. Okay. Whatever you want to identify with it, who cares? That's it's not a non-issue. 
But if every day you wake up and this is the only thing in your consciousness is, is fighting this thing that God made a mistake, God made a mistake and I judge that I'm this, well, you're wasting a lot of energy. That's all I'm saying. At some point, I mean, if you want to be more feminine or more masculine, then do so. Who cares? Yeah. But don't do it because you hate being a man or you hate being a woman. Say that's different than just loving the feminine side of yourself or loving the masculine side of yourself because that could be expressed whatever body you're in. doesn't matter. So I'm trying to teach people a whole different path. You know? Genderless us. What you wear makes no difference. Who you love makes no difference. But if you don't love you, it doesn't matter if you're identifying as male, female, trans, whatever. If you're not loving you, you're not happy. You're, you're really not fully spiritually well. You're not happy. You're a victim of God because God didn't make you the right match for what you feel. And I'm saying, you know, wherever you're at, accept it. If you want to adapt, change. It's like we're all actors in this world. If you want to be a woman, wear clothes. I don't care if you want to be a, a woman that wants to be a man. I don't care. It doesn't. That's your life. That's your choice. Um, but realize, in the end. If that's all you're thinking about and that's all you're focusing on, then you're missing everything else in life. It's not just about that, spending your whole life fighting and trying to identify with the gender. That's like you're going backwards. Whatever you got, enjoy it. Yeah, enjoy whatever you are. Doesn't enjoy. Yeah, but God wants us to enjoy the kingdom. He always tells me I want my children to play and enjoy and music, create. Like he never tells me anything that like what religion says, kind of, you know. Very loving, gentle father. And I mean, you see, obviously, obviously, you're, you're counseling people coming in you with all these issues, and at some point in time, somebody's just got to say, "Love yourself," whatever that means to you. Be yourself, whatever that means to you. But don't focus every moment on that issue. There's a thousand other things going on in life that you're supposed to learn about. And, and, and you're dealing with an issue that is a non-issue in the spiritual world. And so, but, let's go deeper. Trying to identify with male or female is more about trying to find a a, a, a a place in you that you're trying to touch. For example, Yogananda, he possessed feminine traits and masculine traits in his own words, and people around him. In other words, he had intuition and love like a mother, you know, and that caring and compassion, feminine energy. And then he had wisdom, ability to make articulate decisions and data drive, you know, data and fixing things, you know, the male side, you know, warrior, all that stuff. If you're all one and not the other, that's a problem. We really are here to get in touch with both sides. Okay. Let's keep it in balance. A man that's super macho, 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 macho man, right? And he, he lacks the intuition and the compassion and the empathy and sympathy and all these things that we relegate as feminine powers. Wow. Mm -hmm. That person is really missing a lot. Mm -hmm. And then you got some woman she wants to take on, she wants the wisdom, she wants the power, the masculine energy. Energy. And there's a power there in leadership and all this other stuff. And it's more, more hardcore stuff. It's two different energies. All of one overloaded is wrong. But the more balance you get, the better. So all these people with these gender issues out here, go for balance. You know, take on any traits you want. Doesn't matter. But you still got to balance. So... Exactly. We all have 
masculine and feminine yeah. inside of us. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. yeah. So it's like, so it's not like a big decision. Well, I feel, who cares? If you feel that way, live that way. But don't think about it every day. Yeah. You know, it's so if and and so if people make a big deal out of it, and that is their entire structure every day. They're they're just missing the variety of spiritual lessons that they could be learning this lifetime. And then once you reach a certain point where you realize there is no gender, there's no gender issues, there's just love, and then wisdom's the other side, to balance each other, love and wisdom. All wisdom and no love, dangerous. All love and no wisdom, dangerous. You, you, you can't have all the one without the other. It's like being a mother. You got all the love, you know, but, but you can't punish a kid because a kid's a drug addict. Well, you know, you, know, you don't have the wisdom. To, and you, you spoil the kid, and the kid ends up in jail doing terrible things. Or if you got all the discipline and the wisdom and you got no love, the kid goes crazy the other way. So it's like being a parent, most especially where it's, you know, shows you can't be all wisdom in a house or all love. There has to be a balance. That's what's interesting in a household where you got a man and a woman there, or two people that have the feminine and the masculine energy. I don't care what gender. If you have that balance, that's what the child needs. They need a balance between the disciplinarian and the nurturing. So there's a topic I never thought I would talk about, but there you go. Oh, it's very <laughs> important because it's very world current event this is what everybody's talking about on tiktok and stuff reverend bill you know these kind of questions and there's not a lot of spiritual so, insight on it so there's psychology insight on it but we need spiritual no, so it's like, topics i think yeah yeah every, everybody's out to judge these people and beat them up and literally i mean there's real danger worldwide on these people people souls and uh it's something that Mm -hmm. It really doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. The waste of energy is thinking 100% of the time about the issue. Are you helping anybody else? Are you loving anybody else? Mm -hmm. Are you giving something to society? Are you creating anything? Are you Delivering empathy and compassion for the world. Are you changing your frequency? That could be transsexual and have frequency, high frequency. It doesn't matter. I've heard stories, you know, heard gurus and people. I, I have no problem with that. But it's not your focus. It should not be your focus. When you die, you're going to realize no matter what you thought you were, you're, not, you're neither. It's like, uh, whoa, I'm neither. Oh, I'm not that. I'm not, I'm not A, I'm not B. I'm not this side of the coin or that side of the coin. So when you get to that point, then you know you've gone someplace. But it's, it's part of the struggle. And I'll kind of tell you what I think it generates from. Mm -hmm. I think it generates when somebody has lived hundreds of lives as a man. And, they, and, and, and now all of a sudden they find themselves in a female body. And there's a fight. I, you know, I'm used to being a man. Now I'm a woman. I miss the power of being a man. I, 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 you know, the and there's still that spiritual identity from lifetimes as a man, or the opposite. You know, a woman, and then becomes a man. So there's a transitional period where gender's changing after a long period of time, inhabiting one gender or the other. I don't know if anybody's talked about that, but I'll throw it out here. So my feeling on that is this is really a transitional lifetime where you've gone from being a male and now you're born a female or a female and now you're born as, as a male. And there's that fight. It's like, I have something to learn as a man this lifetime, but I don't want to be a man. You know, I want to be the woman I used to be, right? So there's that fight, even though they have to learn this masculine the lesson or female lesson if it's the other way around. So you're given this view of the other party. 
Um, you know, or you, you could have been a womanizer, you know, this man that just was a womanizer and treated women like crap. And all of a sudden, after hundreds of lifetimes being this crappy guy, he's born as a woman. Now he has to learn and he's been treated that way on the, you know, he's on shoes are changed. It's reversed roles. And, you know, so you can't, you can't pinpoint exactly what it is for each person. But I really believe there's a transitional thing going on. And uh, unless one has the power to read the Akoski records for that person and to really look into their past, which might give them clarity, but not my job. Yes, yes. But my job is to tell you it doesn't matter. Except, except where you're at. Deal with it any way you want. It's okay. It's okay. I mean, there's parents out there because I'm dealing with a couple people with their, you know, the parents, the parents are trying to deal with this kid, you know, and it's like, there are no rules. Parents don't know what to do. I said, there are no rules. Just go with love. Individually, that that child, that person, that's, that soul has to make choices. All they have to know is no matter what choice they make, you still love them. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's a lesson for all of us. No matter what choice they make, there's still love. There's still soul. And, but it's it's a subject matter that really brings anger to people. I mean, politics on it is just insane. It's like, whoa! You think these guys were, you know, the Nazis or something? I mean, it's like, oh my God! What are they going to do? Contaminate? Is it catchy? We all going to, you know? It's anyway. There you go. So there's, there's my thoughts on the subject. That these are all our cousins, you know? So everybody dresses in what they it's want. It's all us. Like we're all just one family, you know? But yeah. I just, no, I just that, like those... to that, not one family. It's all us. It's all God. Oh, God. So uh, the God in me bows to God in you. No matter what you think you are, it doesn't matter. It's all a dream. So. Yes. Anyway. Very good. So. But for masculine and feminine is different if you think about it spiritually right like you said like the masculine that says men have to learn and then women i feel like me being a woman helped me connect to the divine mother more and you know that kind of stuff so i feel like that's kind of important to talk about i think right like masculine spiritual yeah there's a there's a balance of balance of energy but in in, in a marriage for you know for, you know getting children and stuff men and women come together it's joined to become one it's literally a joining to become one and in joining to become one they become for a moment in time a creator and they're able to create life just throwing that out there so that's the nature of it and so therefore life goes on so but it's that joining with the male and the female energy now, can you do that in your individual self? Mm -hmm. Can you do that in your individual self? Join the male and the female together. You don't need a you, you could become a composite of that. And the great saints and sages have balanced these traits. So, yeah. So think about wisdom and love and all the things that go into these the energy fields. But... Um, It'd be a very sad world if there was only one gender, you know, and AI produced the kids. No, it, you really need a, a balance. And God made it perfect. God made tolerance. everything perfect. So we just have to let it be how it was created, you know, instead of everything, changing things and growing babies in labs and that kind of stuff that's happening now. So I feel like, yeah, like, we need some of the ancient wisdom with some modern science to kind of be able to survive, right? Like all the things that are coming, because you've seen the future, you had the vision during your NDE. You know, I think I, it looks like this is an issue that's new. But I think if we went back to Rome and Egypt and all these places or Native American tribes, I think this has been an ongoing issue. We just have technology now that can change things. But I think there was always that fight for the balance um and right now it's just it's taken on politics which makes it more dangerous um you know live and let live 
to each their own. I mean, those are kind of trite to say, but really there's something about just allowing people to grow. Um, and uh, so actually a subject I really didn't want to talk about, but now you got it recorded. So there you go. So yeah, it, must, it must have needed to come through. So there it is. Never talked about it before. So there you are. Yes, yes. I feel like you said the, the most important message, which is to love everybody. And I think that no matter what, love everybody. And I think, you know, and I love your book. Yeah. So your book is all the poetry and your observations. And you're always observing and loving different humanity. So I know you love humanity. Your work shows that you're, you went to Europe for 45 days healing people. And then you just got back three days ago. And now you're doing this. So you're committed to humanity. Your heart's in the right place. And whoever hears this, they should know that, you know. So at this topic has to be addressed so everybody can kind of move on from it instead of everybody fighting about it you know so yeah, yeah to me it's um if it ain't about love then it's not god but everything is god right so even evil's god yes yes but, i mean to me though the world i live in it's got to be about love mm -hmm. even if even if i don't like you i still love you i want things to happen well for you that's like with the politics now. Whoever gets elected, there's going to be half the country hate them and, and wish them ill will, no matter who. Which one wins? Half the people are going to hate them. And I'm saying, whoever wins, and this is going to be controversial, whoever wins, support them. Pray they do a good job. Don't pray that they fail. Pray they don't fail. I mean, it's, our, it's who we're stuck with as our leader. Let's try to make the best of it. So I'm trying to say, just make the best of it. And uh, adding adding hatred to whatever happens is not going to fix anything. It's just going to make more people unhappy. And unfortunately, this election will have all, well, half this country is going to be unhappy. Half. Yeah. Doesn't matter. The country loses. Unless people say, whoever wins, we're going to pray for them. We want to help them. We're going to work with the other side. So I'm out there, the lone voice saying that. It's because everybody's taking sides, you know, and I'm going, no, how about the side of love? Vote for whoever you want, and I don't care. But when it's over, there's got to be love. There's got to be love. And without love, you got bigger problems. That's all. That's all. That's that's it. That's my that's why I'm here. So I, I'm the Pied Piper of love. So somebody insulted me a couple of months ago online. Somebody was talking about me, and they thought they were insulting me. They go, "Oh, Reverend Bill, he's just a Mister Rogers for adults." Like that was a big insult. And I'm going, "Yeah, okay, I'll accept that." So I didn't take it as an insult. I'm going, "Mister Rogers for adults." Yeah. Yeah. I, I could see that. I didn't mean Mr. Rogers for a child. Doesn't mean, I'm not insulted by that. I really can affirm that energy of Mr. Rogers, which is a beautiful thing. There's He loved everybody, right? And he taught everybody to love back. And he taught everybody that you're enough. You deserve to be loved. That's what he told children. I'm saying that to adults. It's the same message. So whoever tried to insult me, thank you. I accept it. Like, thank you for rem reminding me of who I am, right? Like that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I couldn't have wrote a better script myself. Yeah. The Mr. Rogers for adults, I thought. But we need that. We need yeah. that healthy, yeah. masculine energy. In yeah. If I put that on a business card, there you go. Here you go. Yeah, that's me. But anyway, there you go. So uh, both of us have had near-death experiences. I've, I've listened to yours. It sounds like we both got uh, kicked back. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's hard to get out of here. You know, sometimes sometimes you got to do your duty. Mm -hmm. And uh, to me, it's all about being a spiritual warrior. I think in your talks and stuff, you talk about the hero, you know, and all that kind of stuff, the journey. And to me, it's a spiritual journey. It's all spiritual warrior. Not meaning that it's, it's not necessarily combat and war, but it's 
spiritual combat. It's overcoming the darkness in yourself to help the darkness in others, to help the darkness in the world. It's all about bringing a light. Mm -hmm. And you, you, I've heard you say because I've watched your stuff. You know, man, how small the candle is, it's still lighting up the dark. You know, and that's true. So I'm out there with my small candle, and uh, I, if I get more people with candles, we're doing good. And if we can get half percent, one percent, ten percent, whatever amount of people we can get given love, it makes this world a better place. It truly makes this world a better place. Yes. It's if like all the, like even if 300 million people, their heart lights were turned on, that would turn on the earth grid, right? That could that, that could really shift the destiny of humanity. That's why this is pivotal times, I think, that all the spiritual people do the discipline and the real work yeah, see the, body yet, right? Yeah, the, the dark energy people, the low energy people, uh, even if there are millions and millions and millions of them, their frequency and vibration is not that high. So millions of those don't equal one or two great people like, you know, uh, uh, Krishna or Jesus or somebody. That could be worth a billion people. I mean, you know, they balance the energy up. So you got people meditating in caves in the Himalayas or an apartment in New York City or in L.A., you know, on a beach. Who cares? There's people around the world that we don't even know about that possess great meditative spiritual frequency and energy that are adding their love to the world. And it has changed it. It's changing it. It could be a lot worse. You go, oh, look how terrible it is. I say, no. Look how it is now. It could be have been worse. This is better than it could have been. And uh, as bad as it looks like it's getting, it's still not World War III. And uh, it could have been a lot worse. So I'm telling people, just keep the faith. Believe and love and give. Even when there's no evidence that anything's changing, it is. If nothing else, you change and you perceive things differently. And you react to things differently because your attitude changes. So for you, the world has changed. Yes, yes. And we can measure people's aura, you know, so when people's heart shock are different, they can actually measure it. And so, like, I'm just hoping, my, huh? yeah, I'm hoping, hoping my aura is bigger than my ego. So everybody, I have to tell this short story. When I first saw you the first time, your third eye, I felt like you were shoot. Like I never felt that before where I was getting pushed back. I never felt that with, and I've met a lot of spiritual every but evers. But with you and I, it was like a shooting. So your aura is very strong. And I feel like it kind of shoots light into everybody's heart in that room. I remember and it was um, Astra's house. And I remember it was like, whoa, so strong. And then the second time I saw you, I was able to actually absorb more, I think. So it was good. The first time I was like, wow, so strong, you know? So, well, you know, what's interesting is when I, I did one in Encinitas, and uh, I did this lady, and uh, she was in the movies and everything. And that's the one I, when I hit her with the energy, she collapsed in the chair, and there was little sparks. But the people in the front row next to where us, the first six seats where I was next to her, said that I, I lit up like a, like a wash machine or a dryer or an appliance where the, the on light comes on red, you know, stove, that the there was a red, you know, for like seven seconds or something, it was like a red. Wow. But I was knocked backwards myself against the wall. And she was, so I've had, and I, I talked about this, I, I had to tone down the level of energy I was giving. Uh, I, I I, I couldn't, and I've toned it down about three times since then. So now it's a real soft, gentle. I just want to yes. restart people's energy and have them use their own, yes. their own energy. But there is, on Sunday, this past Sunday, I was at this church. Did you go to the church when I did? I, I was Maybe. at the, the, the house one, the second one we were in there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This was the one we did at the church. And 
and there was a lady sitting there around a round table, and there was her bottle of water on there. Nobody's knee or body was touching the table, and the floor was like cement and tile, so there was no give. Mm -hmm. But when I charged her and I looked, looked over there, her bottle of water that was directly in the path I was charging her was, was half full. It was jumping up, hitting the cap. It was like like uh, Old Faithful. It was cool. And the reverend of that church, uh, she was watching. I pointed to it as it was happening. She's going, I said, watch, right? Because I stopped for a second and I went, and I did her again a second time. It was just, it was like bubbling over. That woman was taking the energy I was giving her and letting it go through her. It was just beautiful. It was just, but it was like exact lineup where I was shooting the energy. But it was interesting that for me, because I could see it myself, right? And when I called it to the attention of this reverend lady, and then she's, okay, she's watching this thing. We're doing it nothing. I said, watch. I, I'm just looking at it going, watch. I, I go, and it goes, Pow. and then I stop, and it goes, Pow. whoa. <laughs> yeah so even that kind of was like i mean even i'm kind of impressed by that i go well there's a little evidence right there's showing that no this energy really is energy and it's making this water in a bottle you know jump up and down like like an explosion like a geyser mm -hmm. and uh and, and then when i was in uh uh where was i at uh the Republic, uh, Czech Republic. And uh, I was on this lady was doing a show. She was a movie star lady in Czechoslovakia. You know, beautiful lady. She used to be a prima donna. When the Russians were, you know, the Russians and the communists were running the country, she was like the big ballerina and everything, you know. Now she's a movie star and has her own theater. Anyway, she was interviewing me for her podcast. And after the podcast, because I she would hear about the theory, but I said, I said, no theory. Let me show you. And I, and I did this energy on her. And she just, oh, you just, you know, and, and then through the interpreter, the interpreter said she saw like a cyclone, like a tornado of energy coming down through me into her, uh, which I thought was kind of interesting because she was like wide eyed and, and everything. Didn't do it on camera. It was afterwards, but it was, it was kind of interesting because she wasn't quite sure where I was going with this because I was talking to her and had an interpreter into the Czech language. And, uh, and I'm just sitting there staring at her in the eye, speaking English. She doesn't speak English, right? And it's being interpreted behind me. And she's so focused on me. She's an actress, right? She's a movie star, you know? Yeah. And all of a sudden I could tell I, she's just gazed over, right? I finally stopped and I go, do you got any questions? She goes, huh? What? Totally wiped her mind out. It was like, huh? What? what? Elite software. I just, it just, because that's what I try to do to people. Like when I'm doing a group, they should be drifting out. And she would just, because it was one-on-one -on -one and I was just right in her face, right? One-on-one -on -one talking. And she didn't understand the English because it's not the words. It's the power behind the words or in the words. It's the energy. And so she kind of understood. So it was like, whoa. She goes, oh, you know, this, that hadn't happened to her before. Because, I mean, she's a, she does improvisation on the stage. She owns the theater and does improv. And I mean, she can, and all of a sudden she came, came up with a question. It's like, I mean, who the hell am I? Right. It's like, so, so here's this little old fat guy you know, blowing her mind out. And it was like, but it was like that all over Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, every group was a little bit different. We had some, uh, we did quote unquote, a remote healing. You heard that story in one of the workshops. Mm -hmm. um, and and, I, and as I try to tell people that there is no remote healing, it's all here now. It's like, well, we pray for somebody. No, it's, it's all here. It's all you. So when you love you, you're loving that person just it's all here there's no place else well it's around the world i don't care if it's in outer space it makes no difference there is no outer space there is no other place there's no other dimension 
it's all here. That's what people don't get. It just sounds philosophically kind of cool. But I really mean that. There is no place else. There is no other time. Which means it was in a race to become enlightened. And I'm trying to tell everybody, when God wakes up, we're all enlightened. It's, it all happens now. There's nobody getting there before you. It's all... It all is. We're all going there. No one's going to hell. Everybody's going to wake up. Everybody right now in a future now that they can't see or visualize, you're already a Buddha. You know, you're already angelic. You're already self-realized. In fact, you're the next level. You're you're gone. You know, eventually you're, you're absorbed back into the one. You realize there is nothing. There is no ego. Since this ego is identification with a personal history. You believe in your I-ness, and I believe in my I-ness, therefore we have an ego. If you have an ego, you have a body, because that's part of being an ego. You have a body, whether it's a body of light, an astral body, a ghost, an angel body, rainbow body, human body, you got a body. Because you got an ego, because you got a story. And if you, if you have a story, that means you have a birth, you have life, you have suffering, you have pain, you have joy. You have death, you have heaven, you have hell, you have all these things. You have reincarnation. Because you, you bought into the whole story. None of that's real. It feels real when you're going through it. Trust me. Trying to tell somebody that pain's not real is not going to get you too far with people. Just lost a child. You try to tell the person, well, it's all a dream. Well, that ain't going to go too far. You're not helping anybody. It's, it's real for everybody that's dealing with it. But in the other reality, like how could God have all these things and cause all the pain and suffering? There is no pain and suffering. That's like blaming you for your dreams you had. In your dreams, people were getting killed and chased around by tigers and all that stuff. That was real. When you wake up, you don't know, let that ever happen. That's what happens when God wakes up, your dream is over. There was no pain ever. There was no suffering. Mm-hmm. Only in the dream did you believe it. That's a hard one for people. But that's I'm a good one. That's a really good one. Everybody wants to go to heaven. I'm saying, you're not through when you go to heaven. You're not through when you're self realized. Because you're self realized and you're a great master, you still got a body. You got to get absorbed beyond that. There's a absorption, there's that getting rid of the ego. And it always, always, always amazes me. I'm working to get rid of my ego. Yeah, good luck on that. Yeah, <laughs> good luck. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. So there you go. Yes, that's amazing. I love that. I felt that when you said I felt the absorption of like, the, like, it's almost like we have to integrate into source and let all this go and be like, it's already done. And this was, just, and it is like when we wake up from a nightmare, it's just like that, right? Like, it's like that tiger you saw is not there. And I think, it's kind of like that's going to be the grace of God that when we do wake up, we're not even going to remember the pain, and that's the the spiritual power, right? That's the good news is there is no pain; you'll never remember it. But I tell you what, pain, the Buddhist right, pain causes people to search for deeper meaning. If everything was going well in your life, you'd kick back. Why change anything? Why chase the rainbow if there's no pain, no suffering, right? Mm -hmm. So pain and problems serve a purpose. It's all there as a gift for us to evolve, not a punishment. Not a punishment. Nothing's a punishment. We judge ourselves. We punish. We punish ourselves. God got nothing to do with it. Unless you think of yourself as God. Okay, well, the God in this dream is doing it to me, but it's this illusion of free will that you have. If if you have free will, truly have free will, uh, then and, and you're already guaranteed that everybody wakes up and everybody goes to heaven. Was it really free will? It's like you're destined to be waking up. You're destined to be enlightened. 
Mm -hmm. You can't even change it because it's like it's all. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's going to happen to you. I'm sorry, it's going to happen to you. <laughs> so, so many people are worried about it. I think. Yeah, so. nobody's going to hell. Some people could be coming back for a lot more suffering and pain experiences. Mm. And as long as you're believing this dream life, make it pleasant. Make it pleasant for others. Add your love to it. Have a beautiful dream. Don't create nightmares for others, for yourself. That's it. So... Anyway, I'm just an old Irishman. What do I know? <clears throat> I love that. The wisdom of the Irish, because they always have the rainbow. Whenever I see a rainbow, I feel like I see those miracles and blessings coming from God. But yeah, I like that. Yeah, it's like I learned. Okay, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you a rainbow story. I was, uh, my skin cancer got so bad in 1998. <clears throat> it was so bad. I got a photo, but you, it'd be sickening to watch. <clears throat> and my face, It broke out for six months. I missed six months of work. Didn't go to work for six months. Skin cancer, pieces of my face were falling off. It was just a big, bloody, pussy, bleeding mess. It was ugly. Finally started to heal. I mean, I was off from July to January, something of the next year. From 1998 to 1999. And when I had about a week left where I had to go back to work, it was just starting to heal up. I told my wife, I said, I wanted to go to go and drive up to uh, Mount St. Helens because I was there with the kids when it exploded, you know, right, right after it, and everything was destroyed and there was ashes everywhere and the trees were all knocked up. It looked terrible. And I went back there and we drove and it was, everything was growing back. The trees were coming back. The rivers were clear again. It wasn't that gray, oozy stuff floating around. It was, it was even deer and animals back. Birds were coming back from desolation the last time I saw it. And so it felt like that was my face, you know. It was like blown up like this volcano. And then the healing was going to take place. And so that was my thought process. So we're driving over this mountain. And we're, we're just getting ready to go see St. Helens itself, right? And we see this rainbow with the rainbow end right in the road in front of us well you know rainbows it's always an illusion you, you, you can never get to the rainbow it always moves right so it was ahead of you we pull up there and it's right i stop and it's like right in front of my bumper of my truck and i tell my wife i said i'm going out and i go out and she goes out and we look at it the rainbow is right there in the asphalt in front of the truck and she goes well it's an optical illusion I said, you think so? Got back in the truck and we drove, stopped, just drove by the length of the truck. We got out and the rainbow was in the back bumper on the asphalt. Actually moved from in front of us to behind us. We found the end of the rainbow and it was very symbolic. It was just, nobody finds the end of the rainbow. Yes. But and that's cool. That's like the treasure you found, you know, right? Like and it brought, it brought me great peace and comfort. I was ready to go back to work. Mm -hmm. It was like my face was healed. I, you know, I, I felt whole again. And uh, and it was it was just a gift. It was just, of course, I had my radio us playing uh, that song, the Hawaiian song, you know. Over the rainbow. Went, Over the rainbow. The I got my ukulele up there, right, you know, with yeah. Reverend Ike. You know, Ike was... Uh, yeah. The guy's singing that, and I got that playing in the back. I hear that, and I got the rainbow, and I'm going. That's a perfect way to, to end this illness, right? With a real true healing of spirit and mind and the body. So rainbows are very symbolic, but they're also very real. And having had a rainbow body experience, which is another conversation we can have for other time. But that was just like the perfect end, you know, because, you know, I got my roots in Hawaii when I was a young man and everything, you know, so that's the rainbow state, right? You know, and the rainbow warriors from the university and all that stuff, you know, but it was just, 
it was just nice. I saw that and have to share it with my wife. You know, me and my wife, we've known each other since we're 14 years old. And uh, she's going to be 78 this year. So uh, still a kid. So uh, well, we're 50, 50 something years married. That's a long time. We dated in our senior year. Um, then she went to Cal Berkeley and I went to Vietnam. You know, and then we got married later on. But uh, when you wish somebody you love, and they go through all the misery for you while you're sick. And I looked horrible. I looked like I looked like a science experiment that failed. It was, it was like ugly. And she watched me heal. Had me hard on her. She watched me heal. And you share that with somebody that you truly love and you've known since childhood, right? Known since childhood. Yes. That's a beautiful thing. Yes. So. I'm telling you, you create your own beautiful things in life. Believe in love or believe in miracles. And after a while, you realize that miracles are normal. Mm. There's no miracle. It's all normal. Mm. A miracle is just the evidence of love. Mm -hmm. And when you truly love, everything is a miracle. There you go. I love that. That's a great miracles all around for everybody. May everybody receive miracles and have good insight after watching this wonderful talk you've shared with us. It's been so special and I know everybody's going to so really love yourself, love everybody, love your enemy. And just love. Yes. Starts here though. Mm -hmm. Starts here. Yes. Not I. Not you, not me, us. Mm. Us is one. Mm. We are one. Makes it a lot easier. Yes. God bless you, doctor. God bless you, Reverend William Bill. I so <laughs> appreciate you. I have to call you by William because the name I am is in your name. So I feel like I am the will. So I love that. So there you go. I'm going to show you everybody. Will I am. I love this book by Reverend Bill, everybody. Sacred Eye, I would highly recommend it. Yeah, that was uh, two, two, uh, 2003. That was National Book Poetry Book of the Year. Uh, didn't sell a lot of copies. Nobody buys poetry books. But it was recognized by the publishing, you know, publishing association as the best poetry book of the year. It, it's worth something, right? So. Yes, I feel anyway, like I got the book so one poem and you can go very deep into each poem and like let's meditate on it. It's gonna have and, and I feel like it just opens up more. So yeah, it takes about 50 years or 60 years of my life, little pieces that I wrote from traveling around, bumming around Europe when I was 19 to Vietnam to afterwards to having children to you know bumming down the, the Monterey coast, you know, the big sur. And it's all over, but it's it captures a piece of my heart at those times in my life. And you can see it's a spiritual journey. It's it's a journey of love. Yeah. Thank you for having it. Thank you so much. Yeah, I feel like everybody's going to relate to it. So thank you again, Reverend Bill. I hope you have a wonderful day. And I look forward to talking to you again soon. Please say hi to everybody for me. Right. Okay, thank you. Let me just do that.